butt it in. You go right ahead. Well, it's quite all right. And the next one is Stuart uh, Canem. He's a violinist, and he's from Edgemere, Long Island. Believe me, ladies and gentlemen, you haven't heard anything yet. He's really marvelous. And just what are you playing? The Bay by Schubert. The Bay by Schubert, ladies and gentlemen. Well, how long? Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Molly. I'm uh, running an old... <laughs> I don't want to butt in, but Not how old is he? Because uh, this Well, is... just how old are you? Well, ten and a half. Ten and, ten and a half. Ten and a half. Yeah. This well, is the first time, probably, where you had a, a double talk MCs at the end. I, I still think I can take them over, though. But uh, <laughs> not without the violin. Will you go right ahead, then, uh, Murray? Well, all right now. Uh, you just give it to him and. Uh... <laughs> It's too bad, Stuart, that we haven't time to ask you to play an encore. You are, without a doubt, the most remarkable child violinist I have ever heard. Am I right, Murray? What I do you think? I should think so. How long have you been studying? Five years. Five years, huh? And you're ten years old? And uh, uh, that isn't a full-size violin. <laughs> Did you start on that at five years or a smaller? No, a smaller one. Smaller than yeah. that, huh? Three quarters, huh? That's a three quarters, isn't yeah. it? Imagine if 10 or 15 years from now and you're playing the cello up under your chin. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, what grade are you in at school? In public school. Public school? Do you go to public school? Yeah, 5B. 5B? Where do you live? Edgemere? Edgemere. And you're in 5B, huh? Yeah. What do you know, Murray? A little fella in the fifth grade of school and already plays better than Jack Benny. <laughs> 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 well, we want to thank you very much, Stuart, and it's certainly been a pleasure to have you here. And uh, I, I'm still unconvinced. I'm going to watch you play again. I think you've got another arm comes out of your <laughs> sleeve there. I don't think you were doing that all with two arms. And thank you a lot. All right. Thank you so much. Now, ladies and gentlemen, um, we are um, here. Uh, Buck, um, it takes two podcasters to interview one legend. Who are we about to talk to today? Would it happen to be that little boy playing the violin that we just heard? I think so. We're we're here to interview Stuart Kanan, and I'm so, so excited. I can't believe that I actually get the privilege to do this. Yes. Please welcome to the Ballyhoo, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Stuart Kanan. Stuart, are you there? I'm fine. Fine, <laughs> fine, Zach. Thank you. Thank I, you. I, even I liked it. It was not too bad. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we, you, uh, we, we, we were in prepping for this, Buck and I were just marveling at the, the virtuosity that you handled the violin with from that age to, uh, to up till the first convention we ever did. 
Um, and uh, before we begin with questions, I know Buck wants to say something to you, Stuart. Well, just a couple of things. Uh, first off, uh, everybody that's listening to us uh, would love to switch places with Zach and I and get a chance to talk to you. We are so privileged to talk to you as, as Jack Benny fans and Stuart Kanan fans. Uh, the second thing I was going to ask, just to make sure we get your name right as pronouncing it, <laughs> it is Stuart Kanan, correct? Though often they pronounce it as Cannon, and I was just checking that through. You didn't need an answer for that? <laughs> yes. Just... I started life as Stuart Cannon, and after a while I, I was getting so much mail addressed to C A double N O N Canon mm -hmm. and making me out to be an Irish kid. <laughs> and 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 that really wasn't. So my wife and I thought we would change our name from Canon to Canaan. No change in spelling. And that helped a lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's the full and unexpurgated story. That's great. Because uh, Zach and I were listening to the 1965 television show of Jack's Jack Benny, you were on, yeah. and he yeah. refers to you as Canon right. throughout that episode. So <laughs> it, it depends on whose show you on and when it, it got referred to. Well, well, everybody knows that Canon is an East Coast pronunciation and Canon is a West Coast terminology. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, the other thing was that there was someone there who was so famous, Garson Kanan, mm. and he spelled his name with a K-A-N-I-N, -I and I kept getting, I said, no, it's not Garson Kanan, it's Stuart Cannon. So anyway, we changed it, and it's been for 50 years now, it's been Kanan, Kanan so don't change it, please. No, 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 we certainly fine. won't, we certainly won't. And are um, you okay if we refer to you as Stuart today? <laughs> say, say that again. Can we refer to you as Stuart as we're talking to you? I, I, I'm not sure I got your question. Oh, we're we're just wondering if we can call you by your first name, Stuart. Oh, please. We... Stu oh, would be more appropriate. Stu. All right. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Stu. I like that. Appropriate. Wonderful. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. well, Stu, um, we, uh, we all heard the clip uh, from Fred Allen's show. Um, if, if you... Uh, if if you if you feel good with it, we'd love for you to tell us how you got uh, started on the violin and what led you to being on Fred Allen's program. Well, this my start it depended on my my father. Do you know what a madman is about the violin? That was my father. Mm -hmm. He adored the instrument. He couldn't stand a cello or a piano or anything else. But the, the violin was his, just his meat. And one day, out of the clear blue sky around the holiday time in 1931, he brought home a case, and in the case was a violin. And I didn't know what the hell it was. <laughs> but he brought home, opened it, and he played a little bit, just, and he showed me. and. For some reason, I took to it, and and I started my ninety-year journey on the film. And what um what what got you on the Fred Allen show? Because this um uh, for for audience members who were listening, Fred at this time was doing talent show portions of his show, and this was a, a children's version of that. Um, what what was the process of getting on to the show? Well, that um, was easy. In 1931 uh, or 32, 33, my father was earning 25 bucks a week hmm. selling cigars for the uh, Consolidated Cigar Company, you know, just from a truck delivering cigars. And... He, I'm fading out here a little bit. At 96, I, I hope I'm excused and can come back oh. in the never make a minute or so. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and he, oh yes, Fred had an ad in the New York Post advertising for 
child, children who were performers. And he was paying $75 a week, uh, not a week, I mean a show. And I decided, and my dad decided, let's try for it. So we rode away to the show from the newspaper ad, and we were invited in by, I don't know if any of you remember uh, uh, Fred's assistant, Jim Harkins, Uncle Jim, but he was known in the trade. And I went into New York. We lived in Edgemere in, in Long Island, Long Island on the water. And we went into New York and I played the Preludium and the Lego, which is a four and a half minute piece by Fritz Chrysler. And uh, Uncle Jim said he loved it, but the, the corporation that ran the Jack Benny show wouldn't allow someone to take up four and a half minutes of national uh, time. So they said, do you have something shorter? I said, well, I'll go home and look. And my mother and I went, I came home and I grabbed the bead and I got it down, I timed it, I got it down to 45 seconds. Mm -hmm. And I, I came back with it, well prepared, I think. And I played it for Uncle Jim and he said, perfect. He said, we'll put you on right away. So on December 30th, 1936, I performed the B. Mm -hmm. And it was a pretty, pretty good, a good hit. You know, I think uh, Fred liked it and made some crazy remark about Jack Benny, you know, not being able to play at, at, at age 39. <laughs> and that started it. Um, and the next, uh, that was on a Wednesday night because Fred always broadcast on a Wednesday night. And Saturday, Sunday night, uh, Jack, would you believe it, answered him saying he certainly could play. And from there on, it just took off and they just had fun with it like like dogs rolling around in the, <laughs> in the grass <laughs> with a ball, you know. They just played on it and they never talked to each other about it. They just kept firing away these these jokes. So that's that's the story of the start of who knew what was going to happen from that. <laughs> and then I got to be on Jack Benny's show and Fred Allen's again and Jack, you know, so it went, it went on for four years. And if I hope I'm not getting ahead of myself, but in four years, 1944, uh, and I, yeah, about four Jack and uh, Fred had made a movie together called Love Thy Neighbor. Mm hmm and they premiered it at the Paramount Theater in New York. And there was a giant audience and a big stage show with Maury Amsterdam and other people. And while they were on the show, they gave me, presented me with a check for $1,000 to further my music education. And in 1940, that was a pretty good chunk. So. Uh, it still is, so I'm not uh, turning that down. But anyway, <laughs> that's that's what that's the story of that. And and, uh, and and what's amazing about what it's it, it, it sometimes it boggles my mind how uh, your 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 brilliant performance as that child prodigy. The, the the last thing anybody would expect was for it to kick off a comedy feud. <laughs> right. I think it's the it's the one thing no one expects to come out of classical music. But as we as Benny fans know, classical music and comedy are so intertwined with each other. Um, and in that respect, uh, I, I'm so happy that you were uh, uh, given the benefit of generosity by them with that check that they right. never forgot you. Um, and how you kicked off a very good, a very big part of their, both their respective careers. And there was one wonder, you know, Fred was a wit. Mm -hmm. he, he could be funny and a drop of a hat. Jack needed a little bit of a script 
to help him through the stuff. So there's a great story that I heard a long time ago that it was Jack's birthday and for his birthday, they wanted to plant a tree in Waukegan, Illinois, in front of the Jack Benny High School. So they planted the tree and after about a week, the tree died. And <laughs> they said, why did the tree die? They asked, they told Fred about it. And he said, well, of course the tree died. How could the tree grow when the tree was in Waukegan and the sap was in Hollywood? <laughs> I love that one. I love Which that Which was just story. right off the top of his head. You know, it's a great, great <laughs> joke. Was it, was it, um, uh, with, within regards to Fred Allen, I know it's, it's, uh, it's, it's maybe taboo to speak about Fred Allen at a Jack Benny podcast, um, let alone a Jack Benny convention. Um, now that's not true. They were friends in life, but, um, with Fred, you're mentioning his wit, um, you know, did, did um, was there anything like that you remember about Fred beyond his wit, like him as a person interacting with him? Like, how was he to you as a young kid? Well, he was he was very witty. He was uh, it seemed to be closed mouth, only opening his mouth for wit. <laughs> and and uh, Jack was more voluble. You know, he would talk and and. Uh, they were they were just both great 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 guys you know mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I I just remember them so fondly. Can you imagine after ninety years, still remembering remembering that that stuff going on? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's, it's been... so delightful oh. that you do remember those things. And uh, we just had a question about we know that at the time when you were on Fred's show that he would record an East Coast version of his show, and then oh, a few yes. hours later, he would record a West Coast. Did you perform yes, twice? Yes. Well, I, you know, I was 10 years old when I was on Fred's show. <clears throat> and I didn't know, but I played at 9 o'clock in the evening. I played the B. It went very well. And then they said, don't go home. You have to come back and do it again at midnight. <laughs> Why is that? Well, because... California, where Jack lived, was on a Pacific Coast time. So I, I played it again. And I think Fred knew that Jack would be listening because he always they picked up each other's program. So that's what happened, Jack listened. And then the following Sunday, Nobody thought it would happen, but Jack answered Fred and, and said, of course, he could. And then just to prove it, he said, I'm going to prove that Stuart was older than 10. And he, he eventually built a whole show on the fact that I was 10 years, two months, three hours, four seconds older <laughs> than, than 10. That was, you know, that was, <laughs> so that's, that's the way that all went. That bit is amazing, too, because it's basically an interrogation uh, scene with Jack interrogating young Stewart. And yeah. one of my favorite one parts of it is at one point he asked Don Wilson to interrogate you and yeah. he and he grills you about the different flavors of Jello and you get them all right. <laughs> and he go and he turns to Jack and he goes, huh, see, Jack, this kid's all right. There's nothing wrong with him. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, all that stuff you can't repeat. Yeah. Nobody can do that again. Yeah. <laughs> so, Stuart, um, following the check and uh, getting older, um, uh, you you, um, you you ended up being in the service during World War II. Yes, I. Uh, well, let's see. I was ten years old, at the, and then I was fourteen when they gave me the check at the Paramount Theater. And what was looming in my life, I did not know, but there was a war either started in 1941, it started, and it was still going on. And when I turned 18, I was drafted into the army, means I had a letter from President Roosevelt inviting me to join the army. So I didn't say no, I went. And I turned out, it turned out that I got into the infantry and I was a rifleman. 
And here I was, this fiddle player, as becoming a rifleman and going through a basic training. And then I was shipped to Europe with a million other guys to help stem the German tide. And uh, when, when we, the war ended, uh, they, I was sent back to Paris because they were looking for entertainers. And I got into an entertainment company with Mickey Rooney and Bobby Breen. Um, I don't know if you know that name. Not too many people do, but he was a wonderful boy singer. So anyway, we, I, I got into that showbiz. And then about 1945 in July, we had a change of president because of Roosevelt's death. And uh, uh, I, I was asked by my commanding officer if I would go with a pianist by the name of Eugene List, if we they could fly us to Berlin because uh, President Truman was coming across, uh, uh, was coming there, and he, uh, let me see. Oh, yeah, so Gene and I were flown to Berlin along with Mickey Rooney and landed in Potsdam in Berlin, and we drove over to Potsdam, and of course the city had undergone a bombing that once you couldn't possibly believe. And we were billeted in a tent right across the street from a well from a full standing house that Truman was staying in. And when we went across that, that night to play for him, uh, my commanding officer asked Mickey not not to come because he had heard there was someone there who might not understand Mickey's humor. And when we got there, of course, we got up, went up on the back porch and waited for them. And this string of black cars came down the street. And out of one step, Joseph Stalin, another Winston Churchill, and another Harry Truman. Now, can you imagine how I felt? And we had a, a little upright piano on the stay on the back porch. And I put my violin under the piano just to keep it out of harm's way. And she came out, they sat in a, on a sofa, the three of them. Uh, uh, Churchill on the right, as befitting his politics. Stalin on the left, as befitting his politics. And Truman in the center. <laughs> As befitting his politics, and so that's uh, awesome. Truman, and Truman, Truman, Truman said, "Okay, gentlemen, play something." So I went over to the piano and uh, looked down under it. And as I was getting it out uh, from under the piano, Stalin's aide leaped across the room and watched us very carefully. What we took out of that case. Because who knows? I could have made his other history, at that time, but I but I didn't. So anyway, when I, when he saw the violin, he went back to um, being alongside Stalin, and then Truman said, "Play something, gentlemen." And we did. We played a whole about an hour's worth of violin and piano music, because unbeknownst to most people, Truman loved the piano. And he was an accomplished piano, a pianist. And uh, he, he, uh, he, even the next days when we played again, he sat down at the piano and played for his guests who were his own generals and whatnot. And he, he sat down and then while he was playing, he sort of whispered sotto voce to Eugene and myself, you know, I wonder how much better off the country would have been if I had become a concert pianist. And we couldn't believe that what we just heard from the president of the United States. <laughs> anyway, that's that's the story. Oh, there's a picture. My God, yeah, that's Gene Liss. He was a tech sergeant, and I was a vile a PFC. That's the two of us at Flatstam playing on that upright piano. 
Yeah, that's amazing. And you have that stuff. Wow. What a great story. Isn't that fun? Yes, yes. And who knew that I, and oh yes, and then I I said the next morning, I, I wrote to my parents, I said, don't forget to watch out for this story and never thinking it would make headlines. And of course it made every paper and radio station and that's about these two GIs who played a concert for the big three as in they got to be known, yeah. What an amazing experience. It is, yeah, and of course it's never left me. I, I, how can you forget something like that? You can't, yeah. I, I find it kind of amazing that your the, the the violin has been kind of this like uh, this this gate key of sorts to several different moments in time that so many like history buffs would want to revisit and and go to themselves and it's and and this is and i would imagine for for part of you this is you know as you said you're just like i didn't you, who you didn't know what was ahead of you and yet you you've taken it all in stride and when you got out of um, uh, when you got out of uh, the armed services, you did find yourself going on to teach music. And around that time, you also reconnected with Jack. Can you talk a little bit about uh, your time? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, in the meantime, yeah, I, I yeah. got married, started to raise a family. You know, that's what people did in 19, when was it? Fifth. 52 I was uh, married and started a family mm -hmm. and we moved I had to think of making a living so we moved to Oberlin I was offered a teaching job at the uh, Oberlin Conservatory of Music and uh, making uh, I, I'm sorry about fumbling around here but the no. old you know, you know, you'll know what happens when you hit it, and you'll when you hit it, you'll know what's what's happening. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, I uh, oh yes, we were, I was living sitting in the Oberlin in my house, and the phone rang, and a voice came on, and my wife answered the the phone, and and she turned to me with kind of got pale, and she said. It's Jack Benny. I said, oh, well, you know, it could be anybody. So uh, I answered the phone, and of course, the minute he said, this is Jack Benny, <laughs> I knew that it was really Jack Benny. <laughs> and he invited me to come on, uh, I think it was 1965, am I right? Yes, you're yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, to come on his show, on his television show mm -hmm. from Hollywood, because he had a full-time uh, hour show on TV. Mm -hmm. So we went out, we drove out to, I mean, we got out to uh, to the Roosevelt Hotel in Hollywood, and uh, uh, I, I was on his show, and I, I played, he asked me to play, and I played a piece called La Vida Breve by Manuel de Falla. And it's a wonderful piece. And I know there is a recording around someplace. Uh, we well, have Zach and I listened yeah. to it just the other day, and and it was delightful, that piece. Yeah, it's we a pretty it. good I, Even I am proud of it. It's, it's pretty good. So uh, I played that, and, uh, and we had a nice chat, and we played a little duet. Uh, of the B, and I took the hard parts and he took the easy parts. But you know, that's um, that's where oh, oh, that's it. Yeah. Did you have to adjust uh, you your want... playing to play a duet with Jack? Did you have to slow it down yeah. or something? Or, <laughs> well, <laughs> well, hey, I was a guest on the Jack Benny show, <laughs> yeah. I did what was necessary. <laughs> <laughs> if we want, Stuart, I can play it here for us. I have it queued up for us right now. Oh, boy, um, here I'd love queue. to hear that. Yeah, go ahead. Here, I've, I've, yeah. I've got it here right now. And make sure the volume a little bit, here. Zach, so Virginia, we can hear it better. Yeah. Yeah, okay, go. Mm -hmm.
still amazing. Yeah. That is still, so wonderful. Still amazing. He was wonderful. I don't remember the details of that performance, but he would stop at some of the hard places and then pick it back up again. Yeah. But he, he went ahead and he memorized the whole damn thing, you know, which is, you know, shows how serious he was. He was now a, back a, in the day when you were 10 or 11, that time frame when you were on Jack's show. When you played the B on his show, you played it by yourself. You'd never played a duet with Jack until 1965. That's right. right? Correct. Mm. Absolutely right. You know, I have another funny story about Jack. Great. Go. Uh, yeah, that he loved the violin so much he couldn't keep his hands off it. You know? And once the violin, the great violinist Pinkus Zuckerman was playing. At, uh, at the Chandler Pavilion in, in uh, L.A. And a great recital, it came out, the thunder was applause, it came back and forth. And finally there was a pause, and who should come out from the wings, not Pinkus, but Jack Benny, dressed in tails, <laughs> and <laughs> accepting the plaudits of the crowd. <laughs> That's the way he was, you know, it just... Uh, funny guy anyway he, um, guy. you what's what's funny is that we, when we see when we look at that clip there um you um first of all i i wanted to make a connection to previous ballyhoo discussion point val luton the cinematographer of films like cat people and isle of the dead was the cinematographer for that episode of the jack benny program nick musaraka he also did backup work on the Magnificent Amberson. So you had some you had some primo cinematic wow. lighting there. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I always thought it was very good, I but I never knew. I don't know the inside stuff on this. No. It was really amazing, yeah. Leave it to me to just look at that look at credits and just <laughs> fawn over them. But yeah. the um yeah. the the big thing that you take away from I take away from that duet is that this is around a time where Jack is stopping or really ro slowing back his role on TV and comedy. Um, and he's focusing much more on these benefit concerts. And yes. you were, you among, uh, along with Isaac Stern, were instrumental in uh, 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 nurturing that, um, uh, that love of the violin he had and figuring out concerts for him to play for benefits for pension funds. Can you talk a little bit about kind of being a de facto agent for Jack in some respects? <laughs> well, uh, uh, Jack uh, just loved the violin and wanted to help musicians, help orchestras. And I, I, I don't know what, what something funny happens to me. I was, uh, you know, he did a lot of on, uh, outside performances. And then like uh, in, in Long Island, I forget what the name of the play, the, but he... He's standing off stage, and then finally he says, and now my violin, please. And a stagehand takes the violin and throws it along the floor, and it clatters <laughs> to a hole. <laughs> right? <laughs> and of course, he gives that look, that $2 billion look that you can't find anyplace else, and then picks it up and kind of dusts it off. <laughs> <laughs> and I had a little question here about playing at Hopkins Center in Dartmouth College. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I remember that too because we had played, Jack and I and my colleagues had played chamber music together uh, for some time the, the day before. And uh, and then he played he played a concert for the... Uh, for the the students and the and the orchestra, and there was the other one where he was in San Francisco, uh, and uh, he's let's see how that goes. Oh yes, uh, he's he's standing there waiting to get his violin, you know, accepting the applause of the audience, and he's standing there, and somebody. A guy comes out with a broom and overalls and starts to sweep up. And, and, and Jack, Jack asked him to hold his violin for a moment. <laughs> so 
the guy does with the puts the broom aside and then whips out the bow and plays the Mendelssohn concerto <laughs> <laughs> as as he, he as he was a, just a standing he was from the orchestra wonderful guy and uh, that's uh, that was it I still remember it Jack and uh, wow <laughs> you you have your your uh, help can play. Yep. Mendelssohn, that's, that's pretty good. Anyway, that's... And uh, Stu, you, you said before that you're 96, and so we got to be kind of careful with you, and, <laughs> and you, you do things a little slower and things. But I'll say, out of this whole convention, I think you're the only person, only guest we've ever had that read a question out of the chat and answered the question yeah. himself without us even having to do it. So, yeah. We don't even need to be here. We can just let the chat go, and you just talk to the chat. <laughs> welcome to the well, welcome to the Stu well, Canaan that's, convention. <laughs> you know, that's, that, that's part of my life. Uh, uh, I wouldn't be where I am if it weren't for my playing on Fred's and Jack's program. Yeah. yeah. And you, you repaid that favor in stride because of the work you, um, you would, um, I mean, I remember it was two years ago at the first convention you had talked about finding places that Jack could play for those, for those pension funds and the amount of work, you know, cause you, you yourself ended up becoming very, uh, pro uh, profound and renowned in the music world later on becoming a concert master and I'm wondering as a musician and not as a um, not as somebody who was on the Fred Allen program or Jack's program, but as a musician, what do you how do you feel about the contribution Jack made to classical music? Well, I can't say that Jack saved music. <laughs> because, we're going, because we're going through tough You can say it. <laughs> I can say it. But he, he just, his heart was in the right place. He would do anything, drop anything, if an opportunity came. Oh, yeah, I remembered one little episode. He, he, he always talked about how much he should charge for the seats. And he said, well, my thoughts were I would charge the most uh, you know i'm forgetting it oh it was um, a different difference in price right. yeah it's if the... you were close to the front or to the back <laughs> yeah <laughs> the cheap seats were in the front and the expensive seats were in, the, in back. the back yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. further away from oh, yeah. Right. yeah yeah uh, just i have a question for you mm -hmm. just a muse a couple musical questions if that's sure. okay um, one, when you were a kid, did you have certain uh, violinists that you looked up to that you thought, oh... Well, yeah, we were sure. And a quick answer to your question is Yasha Heifetz was the boy that we all looked up to. That, that was something, that was just a gift from the heavens that you find someone who could play like that. And then, of course, there were others, uh, Isaac Stern, Fritz Kreisler, and a lot of, you know, but all, all of that caliber... We were dead set on becoming great artists like those guys, but you know, life take turns differently. Yeah. Well, who <laughs> who did you end up playing with that you thought, oh, I didn't think I'd ever get to play with this person, and I just really got a chance to enjoy playing with that person. Is there anybody that you did that with? Well, I was in the San Francisco concert master of the San Francisco Symphony for ten years, yeah. and I. I I can't really pick out anyone, but you know that's a high quality, and and that was enough for me. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And then the, my last musical question for you is: uh, Did you have um, what? Like, what are there any certain things that you're like proudest of musically that you had a chance to do or or had a chance to perform something? You know, I hate to interrupt you, but I just there was just a question here about Martin Shalafor, who was the concert master of the Los Angeles Philharmonic, that Jack donated his violin, his Stradivarius violin, to the Los Angeles Philharmonic, and it's now being played by uh, uh, Shalof, Martin Shalafor, hmm. who is the concert master of L.A. Phil now, yeah. That's neat. Wow. Go ahead, Zach. If you no, got a no, no. That's 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 very much okay. Um, you know, it's 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 kind of remarkable to um, uh, to to see the journey that you've had, Stuart. And we want to um, 
Uh, I want to let people know in the chat, if you've got some questions, if you put them over in the Q&A function, I can better e read them out and I can get some out here. But I want to ask a question while we're getting some in there. Um, uh, so, you know, we, we've, we're very Jack centric here. Um, and you're but, very what? I'm sorry, we're, you're we're, very we're very Jack Benny centric here. Oh yeah, yeah, um, yeah. obviously <laughs> for for obvious reasons. Yeah. But I wanted to know, apart from Jack and apart from Potsdam, in your in your long story life from after the war up to now, what what's what's one of the most memorable achievements you've done in the field of music for yourself? Like, and whether I mean Stuart or uh, um uh. Buck was asking if there was somebody you had played with, or was it one particular concert that you enjoyed above all else? Well, uh, the Potsdam experience, of course, was something extremely major for me. Oh, and yeah. I, also, I also went to uh, uh, Genoa, Italy in 1959 and won the international violin competition called the Niccolo Paganini Violin Competition. And I took first place in that, which was very, very nice, yeah. I thought of one more thing that I, I want to ask because I don't think we ever quite got to this, but um, just knowing Jack as long as you did and appearing with him different times, different stages in your life, um, what, what are some impressions you've you've taken away from Jack and things that, that you can tell us about your relationship with him? Well, Jack, if you ever needed him for something, you'd know where to find him. He was in his men's room playing the violin, <laughs> practicing. He was, he was serious about it. And he's played many times with great artists, you know, so that's, he just, you know, he was a, he was a softy. He was a, a sweet, sweet guy. Uh, I don't know how he was in the business <laughs> writing comedy. That's no sweet job, but uh, he he was just just a wonderful person. Fred uh, yeah. was not as not as uh, warm as Jack was. Fred was more businesslike and more thinking always of the next funny line. Jack kind of rolled with the with the tide, you know, so. I think, it, I think a, a, a Jack um, uh, once remarked about Fred, that here's a man who has, um, who has a, a, a dear devoted wife. He's a success, one of the funniest men in show business, and he is eternally unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's, that's just the way it is. That's whoever said that, really. Yeah, we have a we have a question from Catherine Fuller Seely. She wants to know: After you appeared on the Fred Allen Show, did your neighborhood uh, kids and schoolmates talk about it and you? Oh boy, did they! When I came home from the first performance, I had no idea of the power of radio, none whatsoever. But when I came into the classroom the next day, everybody was shouting and telling uh, hi and bravo and all that kind of thing. I never thought anyone else in the world had heard me. <laughs> except, That's charming. <laughs> except for people who were at the studio that day. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sure. It was a big hit. <laughs> yeah. And then well, I have a note here that you uh, performed like... A you had some connection to Jurassic Park and Schindler's List and things. Oh, yeah. One Can of you my, go a little bit into that? One of my jobs later in life as a, after San Francisco concert master, I moved to the Hollywood, uh, to Hollywood and worked in the studios for 15 years. I was concert master for John Williams, you know. He just turned 90 this week or... And um, uh, I, I played a lot of those famous um, movies. I was concert master and had solos in a lot of them. So anyway, that's Schindler's cool. List. Oh, Schindler's, yes, yeah. I did not play. It's not Perlman played the big violin solo that John wrote, but I was in that small orchestra that 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 played in that in that film. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's 
Oh, well, and it must have been it must have been unique to work with a youngster like uh, Wister Williams um, because he's yeah. only ninety, and so well, he said he's catch. He he came to San Francisco just the other day, and he asked for me. I they said he's not here, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's. Uh, He's he said he's ninety and he's catching up with me. So, <laughs> I'm ninety six, so we'll see. We'll see who gets there first. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. <laughs> so that's that, that's my story. That's a great story, and, yeah. and what a wonderful life. What a yeah, just so eventful and. Uh, that I'd never heard the story about World War II, and that was so interesting. Thank you. Oh, yeah, that. yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I still, oh, yes, I still remembered getting on the troop ship in New York Harbor, and I was walking up the gangplank with my barracks bag, my rifle, and my violin. Mm -hmm. And my commanding officer, when I got to the top of the ramp, he said, what are you going to do with that? Pointing to the, I said, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I'm glad you took it. <laughs> oh, my yeah, gosh. I was very glad I took it. I mean, it's amazing. You were, I was debating, should I carry my fiddle across, you know, take a chance and banged up and all that. But I did, and look. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> yeah, so wonderful. Uh, did you? I know that Jack had a Stradivarius. Yes. Um, did Did you get a chance to ever hold his Stradivarius or look at it? And and what did you oh, think? Oh well, sure. Name? Oh yeah, we tried them. Yeah, I, he tried mine. I tried his. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's. that's yeah. Gotta, couple of questions in Q&A. All right, wonderful. We can ask those, and then I'll have one more thing to show the, the audience here and you, Stuart. Um, okay. So Rodrigo wants to know, Mr. Kanan, this might sound like a silly question, but what do you think about the character Professor LeBlanc on Jack's show? <laughs> uh you, you're gonna have to refresh my memory about. Oh, Professor he LeBlanc. is uh, ja he, he is Jack's, Jack's teacher, wasn't he? Yes, yes, he was. Yes, yeah. Uh, I I don't know much about Professor LeBlanc. I'm sorry. I wish would, I could. Would, would you have liked to have been Jack's violin teacher? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a funny question that's a funny he, question <laughs> he, he, he couldn't have got any worse right no. <laughs> no. Stuart somehow it's coming out even worse than before yeah. <laughs> coming in what no no it's, it's just imagining like if you were giving him lessons he's just like somehow it's coming out even worse I don't understand <laughs> <laughs> oh, well no, okay. you, if anything, I think you would have upped his game by so much more. Like it's, and, and we're going to have evidence of that in a second, but we have two more questions. Okay, um, St Steve, uh, Steve wants to know whereabouts do you uh, live now and do you still play? And thank you for your contributions to music and Jack Benny. <laughs> thank you. Well, I live in Berkeley, California. I'm still alive. But I'm not in good shape. I fell and I did what my doctor said, don't fall. I fell and I broke my leg and they put me in, in, in a wheelchair, which I'm still in. And, but I still pick up the fiddle occasionally and try to remember how it goes. And I think I'm having luck, but it's very hard. Once you, once you lose 90 years, <laughs> mm -hmm. I, of playing, you know, it's hard to get back. But I'm there. I'm here. Well, Jack always said you have to play a lot just to play lousy. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, good. yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Well, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we have one more thing to show the convention before we close this episode of the Ballyhoo Buck Benny OTR review uh, tribute to Mr. Stuart Kane. And now Stuart um, the question uh, by Dave Wesley, 
is if you are able to enjoy playing the violin currently. And before we, uh, I think you answered that, but two years ago at the very first Jack Benny convention, you showed the world that you still know how a B should sound. <laughs> I, I'm, oh, oh my goodness. Yeah. For heaven's sake. No, I, I went, I was looking up different performances of the B to listen to them uh, these last few months. And uh, I never could find one that I liked better than your performance <laughs> that you did at 10 years old. I really yeah. like that one I just heard that you that you did mm -hmm. just a couple yeah. of years ago. They, they, those Thank are you. really good. A lot of people, I don't know, they don't play it quite as fast as you do or something. I mean, I, I love the way you play it. It's an, it was it was wonderful that you gave us that gift two years ago, Stuart. And um, I I will confess that one of the reasons I wanted to have you uh, a part of this convention again is because that first panel was incredibly inspirational, and I wanted to have the chance to, to do it right well, by I talking hope to you I'm myself. Here for the next panel. <laughs> oh, you will! I guarantee it. Yeah. And, and, and Buck, oh, you guarantee me. Okay. Well, I have a promise to keep now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, um, but um, Buck, thank you so much for helping me with this interview. Stuart, it was a pleasure and an honor to see, speak hey. with you once again. 